Hi, everyone. So my name is Emma. Uh, I'm not going to spend too long introducing myself, because I hate when other speakers spend and dedicate three or four slides to talk about themselves. If you're interested about me, I'm sure you can find enough information online. Um, I'll be walking you through several steps today. Um, I'm going to be defining deep learning in a way that's a bit intuitive for you. And that's because it's very important to understand that as we actually progress uh, through the presentation today. Uh, so I'll give you some definitions and a primer to deep learning, very crash course in, let's say, 10 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes. And then I'm going to be showing you a lot of crazy examples of what can happen when AI is actually biased. And it's probably biased in many more uh, scenarios than you would think. I'm going to be showing you some security implications of using machine learning because machine learning is trying to replicate how the brain works in a way that resembles the brain. So there is always unintended consequences. Um, I'm also going to be talking you through job displacement. Uh, this is an area that is pretty passionate for me, not trying to displace people, but actually trying to help people uh, transition into new roles where they find themselves relevant. Um, and I'm an example of that myself. I'm a marketer, then transitioned into a data scientist position and now uh, a product manager. And then finally, I'm going to give you a roadmap for things you need to be studying. And I really want you to take notes on this, because that is going to be the most important steps uh, in, in, in the next five or 10 years. Cool. So let's start, start off with some definitions. If you think about it this way, um, AI and machine learning today is being used synonymously. Uh, but they're actually not the same. AI refers to kind of the entire discipline. It refers to the concept of getting uh, uh, you know, computers to learn from mistakes. Machine learning is actually an implementation of AI. It is how you solve AI problems. They are the mathematical functions uh, to achieve this kind of um, the biological brain's uh, imitation. So, you cannot do machine learning uh, without actually doing AI. In machine learning, the machines start off dumb, and then you uh, gradually make them smarter by actually telling them, this is wrong, this is right. It's pretty similar to a dog. The only difference is this dog can impact billions of people uh, if you do it wrong. And then you have deep learning, which is really where a lot of the hype is around today. But it's a concept that's at least 60 years old. Um, and it's just today where it's taken off for several different reasons we can touch on in the Q&A. I really like this slide because so many people think machine learning is you know, someone sitting and sparks flying out of their head doing uh, uh, machine learning. This is a basic, very, very, very basic uh, five-liners uh, code that I think I wrote some time ago. But that's basically it. I mean, what you're doing here is, uh, let me see if this works. OK, it's a bit laggy. I think so. Uh, it's for the Facebook Live, I believe. Um, so basically, what you're doing in the first two rows, you are importing some libraries that uh, other people have written to make it easier for you. And then you are running a machine learning model. That's the Gaussian uh, NB there, naive base. And then you are fitting it to a data set and then making predictions based on that model on new unseen data. Um, and the final line is not really necessary. It's just printing out the accuracy. So that's, in essence, what traditional machine learning is. Of course, I'm oversimplifying. But this is very basic. And you can actually do a very simple machine learning project, like predict who's going to survive the Titanic uh, based on you know, uh, weight or age or gender, um, height, all of these things. You can actually do that with those four or five lines of code. Now, when we get to deep learning, it's a bit more complex. Uh, so this is an example of, of deep learning. Uh, so this is an, uh, a number. Uh, it's based on a data set that I'll be showing you in a bit. It's called the MNIST. The MNIST data is a lot of handwritten digits, I think around 60,000 handwritten digits. And then you have these uh, six steps where, again, you see the same pattern. In step one, which I've uh, notated, you are doing uh, importing these libraries. And then step two, you are uh, splitting up the data set into a train and test 
Train and test is actually so cool. Um, it's the way that you're predicting the future. So basically, someone very clever came up with this idea of saying, hmm, how do we predict the future when we only have current data and historical data? Well, the solution is very simple. You take that full data set you have, split it up, and let's say 80%, which you do your machine learning modeling on, and then you hide from it, let's say 20%, the remaining, and you tell it, oh, we have some new data. Can you make a prediction on it? You already know what the right predictions should be, and so that's how you actually build these machine learning models to predict the future. Um, and again, here in step three, they are creating a deep learning model um, and then specifying how many layers it should have. I'll show you what that means in a bit. And then finally, fitting it um, and then doing some evaluation and uh, predicting some scores with it. And this very simplistic version is actually 87% accurate in the MNIST data set, which is pretty uh, incredible. Now, the difference between machine learning and deep learning, the way that you can think of it is machine learning is very powerful, uh, these traditional machine learning models, and they perform very well maybe on 3,000 rows of data. Think of it as a spreadsheet. If you only have 3,000 rows of data, you can actually get very far with traditional machine learning. If you have millions uh, or you have big data that can't even be booted up in a single computer, that's where deep learning starts to take off. Because what deep learning does is it spends so many resources to actually try and understand every single pattern within that data set you give it. So the more examples it has, the better the chances for it to actually learn those uh, correlations. Um, this is, let me see if that works. Doesn't. So this is a video which was recorded by someone wearing uh, a device on the head while wearing these uh, AR um, augmented reality devices. And then it's tracking where they are looking and it's showing kind of the brain activities as they happen, a human, uh, the biological brain. So you're only able to actually visualize three million of those uh, neurons and in total the 400, like half a billion synapses. But the full brain, as you can see, is actually much bigger than that. Now, if we compare this to state-of-the-art deep learning, which is the ResNet 152, that's what the name is, uh, it only has 60 million synapses. So you have to put that in context. Machine learning can repeat very specific tasks that we, as humans, can do. Deep learning can do that. Um, but as you start to abstract to newer and more complex and diverse activities, human beings are actually taking over there. Some other differences. So we have 10 million times more synapses than an artificial neural network at a deep learning, a basic deep learning model. Uh, deep learning uses a technique called gradient descent. Uh, so gradient descent is, imagine this coffee machine behind you. You're trying to find out what the right temperature is for the right coffee, like the, the coffee that tastes best. And then you try, turn it to the max. OK, that uh, tasted burnt. And you turn it low, the temperature. And you keep experimenting until you reduce the painful taste. When you have reduced that taste and reached that bottom, that's actually how gradient descent works. You keep on iterating to reduce the amount of mistakes you make for a particular metric, KPI. Um, but we don't actually know how, how the human brain l uh, learns. And this is so fascinating that we are trying to create these proxies, but we don't understand how the brain actually learns. Um, and, and, and you'll start to see this reoccurring th uh, theme. Um, I'm, I'm deliberately trying to put artificial intelligence in a bad light because I'm an AI practitioner. I build models myself. Um, and I actually hate that hype that people are adding to it because it isn't that complex and it's very, very stupid. Um, but as you start to learn from your mistakes over many million iterations, it becomes pretty clever. So I want to head into AI ethics um, and I'll start off with a definition. So when I talk about AI ethics, I understand it in this way. It may be that you have a different definition, but at least this is the context. Um, so it's pertaining to the moral behavior of us as 
the creators of AI as we construct and use these artificially intelligent machines. And we also, it's also around how we use them and how we may abuse them. And bias, when I talk about bias, I want you th to think of it as a spectrum uh, where you have either very extreme bias towards one thing or towards another. In this case, maybe it's left wing, right wing. This is how we are accustomed to think about bias. But in the context of data sets, when I talk about bias, I mean this particular example. Sorry. Just that up. So this, this particular example where the data set you have actually doesn't accurately reflect the world that it's sampled from. Um, I'll show you in a second. So given that definition, we need to be looking at what deep learning actually is. And in particular, I've specified, uh, I've limited the, the explanations to images, because that's where a lot of the very uh, high risk, high reward projects are currently. So this data set, I was showing you a bit earlier an example from it. Um, it's, a, it's a real world data set of digits being uh, handwritten by humans. And it's 28 by 28, so 28 pixels and 28 pixels like that. Um, and then this is the hello world of deep learning. If you want to get into deep learning, usually this is how you start building your first model. But there's also a different data set, and that's called the Fashion MNIST. It's actually created by uh, Zalando. Um, and in this uh, example, they give you articles for, I believe it's around 70,000 images in total of 10 different classes. So it could be shoes, it could be t-shirts, it could be uh, bags, things like that. And again, it's in grayscale. And there's a specific reason for that, which I'll touch on in this section here. So now we're going towards more complex data sets. This is called CIFAR 10. And CIFAR 10 is now 32 by 32. So it's a bigger image. Um, but also, you can see its color. Uh, it's colored images. And colored images actually add a lot more complexity to deep learning. So finally, you have the most complex of all data sets. This is called ImageNet. And it contains uh, 14 million images of 22,000 categories. So that could be a dog, a hyena, a bag, a child, um, a hungry dog. So 22,000. And this is where re researchers are working from like Stanford University, Microsoft, and Google, where they are building those deep learning uh, neural networks. And here they are testing to see how they perform. Um, no one can actually run this on their own machine. It's too vast. So you need to have these supercomputers that only very few companies and uh, universities have access to. Right, so as I was telling you about before, uh, these artificial neural networks, let's just call them ANNs for brevity, uh, they're actually extremely weak because you can't just give it an image and tell it, I want you to predict what's on, the, uh, what, what's on this image. You have to do a different technique. So that image, it's 28 by 28. You then have to actually uh, stretch it out so it's only one line full of pixels. So you, that would be 784 pixels, right? And then the way that a computer sees, this is actually how, how it looks to a computer. It translates that image to numbers. Is there anyone that can see any pattern with the numbers compared to the image? So the patterns you can see it's very close to 255 as it gets more white around the image. And when it's black, the image, it's close to zero. And then you can start to do statistical analysis to see whether there is any correlation between that particular row. That's actually how uh, computer vision works. And then you have kind of uh, some certain numbers uh, for every pixel, and then it spits out what digit it is. And in this case, it would spit out an eight. That's how uh, uh, artificial neural networks work. Very basics, but it's actually on the pixel level. Now you can imagine this is only on a 28 by 28 pixel. What happens if you have a, a 4K image or a full HD image? Now you're adding a lot more complexity. That's why you start off with these smaller images. If you can master that, then it's just a matter of additional computational power to actually be able to do the full scale images. But 
ANNs are actually not that powerful in themselves. They just memorize what's on the picture and then do some correlational analysis on it or correlational measures. This is where CNNs come into play. CNNs are very interesting because what they do different to uh, ANNs is they actually try and pick up corners, edges, uh, shapes. So for every step, it tries to pick up something that is more complex. And that's what uh, I'm trying to show here. So for a cat, let's say we give it a picture of a cat. It then tries to pick up, oh, there is a curve here. That's one shape and another here. And then this is the basic layer. And then it's able to make a more complex layer where it says this must be an ear, this must be its nose, this must be its eyes. And therefore, it then adds a score, whether this is a cat or a dog or something else. Um, CNNs is where uh, the self-driving car technology is being used. Is this a passenger? Is this a bike? Is this a car? Um, and there is one weakness to it. Actually, it's its strength, but also its peril. Um, so let me see if I, yeah. So this is actually the limitation of CNNs. Because it detects pattern, it's indifferent to where it sees the pattern. So these two images are actually identical to a CNN network. Um, but to a human being looking at it, of course it's not identical. But this actually has huge ramifications once we get into the security risks. So let's look at a few examples of what bias actually means. I want you to try and think about this example. Those of you who know it, um, it will be a bit easier. Imagine yourself uh, being a, 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 a statistical expert, a PhD in the Second World War. You live in Manhattan. Uh, you have Jewish descent. And the US Army comes to you and says, um, hey, we have uh, all of these planes returning from the war. Um, and these are the bullet holes. We can't reinforce the entire plane we can, because then it would be too heavy. It wouldn't be able to maneuver uh, good enough. And yet, we can't make it too light because then they get shot down. So they show you images of bullet holes. So let's say you see this picture. What's the first thought or maybe recommendation you would come up with? Where would you reinforce? Well, Sorry? These are planes that came back. <laughs> that's <laughs> so exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's what uh, Wald, a statistical expert, said. Hang on, guys. Hang on. These are all of the planes that came back. And actually, you shouldn't reinforce any of those bullet holes. You should enforce all of the other areas where there are no bullet holes, because those are the planes that didn't come back from the war. This is a very good example of bias. Because if you were just looking at that, you would say, oh, yeah, we need to add it here. But actually, this is a sample that is not representative of all of the flighter jets or flighter planes in Second World War. Now, to something a bit more serious. And this is where you're going to start to see some of the issues. So I found a chart that uh, looks at skin distribution or skin color distribution around the world. And I want you to keep in mind that the state of the art machine learning and AI research happens in North America. It happens in uh, UK, actually, and in Canada, and in China. So there are certain patterns here. It tends to be people that are fair-skinned, right? Um, the state-of-the-art research is not happening in other countries where the skin color is brown. And this actually has challenges which Google found out firsthand. So Google recently launched a competition to be able to predict black women uh, accurately and classify them because they are struggling with that. And I'll show you some examples. So this is a PhD from, uh, I actually forgot which school, I think from MIT. Yeah, MIT Media. Uh, she is showing you some of the challenges of uh, the current sta state of the art research. So this is using algorithms built by top tech companies to classify whether it's a human being or not. So it's accurately identifying a Chinese woman. Nope. Then she wears a white mask. Then it identifies and picks up that she's a human, or it's seeing a face. Now, this is a direct consequence of actually those researchers that are in North America and in uh, the UK and China. They are using data sets from around them, right? 
They're not going to Africa. They're not going to the Middle East, maybe, or some other areas. And this has huge ramifications on the output of those models. Um, another example is she then benchmarked it against Face++ and Microsoft's uh, facial recognition systems, all of these state of the art, and she found even worse catastrophes uh, from that. So she given that photo of her. Face++ is, they label themselves as state of the art. Now this is a man, okay, it identifies it's a man with gender. It says zero faces found. And here is the interesting bit. So both IBM and Kairos actually not just said uh, 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 that, uh, sorry, they detected her face, but they misgendered her. Um, they believed it's, it was a male here. So they are struggling. These AI models are actually struggling to classify people of color. Now, this is an example of what happens, actually. So Google, this entire shitstorm happened, if I can put it uh, correctly. Um, so two people of color that were taking photos of, the, of themselves uh, ended up actually becoming very pissed off because Google Photos, let me see if I can put it down here. It's a bit laggy. Google Photos said they are two gorillas. Now, then once both of them actually went to Google Photos and entered gorillas, it found all of the pictures of them. And this is not just dangerous, but it's actually very uh, insensitive. But Google, it, 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 wasn't, uh, it wasn't intentional. And so what Google did to fix it is they censored every search result for gorillas. So you could find chimpanzees, you could find gibbons, you could find everything you wanted, but gorillas. And I actually, if you try and search for it now, I think they still haven't solved it. And this is a huge challenge for them. And again, it's due to these machine learning models being built by people that are predominantly white. Um, and a good example, actually it's, it's a very terrible example, but uh, uh, there was this uh, example of um, the AI hand washing dispenser, like soap dispenser, <laughs> a silly idea someone crazy came up with. Um, and it worked very well, but then when people of color went there and put their hand for it to dispense, that's not a hand. So it wouldn't dispense soap in the toilets. Uh, because it was, again, trained in North America, where it was predominantly white people. But beyond these examples, they also have real implication on justice. Um, so this company called North Point uh, ha has built these risk assessment models, meaning if anyone in the U.S. in several states gets arrested um, and then they are being scored on 137 questions. Uh, some of those questions are pulled directly from the criminal records. And based on that, there is a score given to them out of 10 on how likely they are to become repeat offenders. And this result is actually being used by the judges to help them uh, during these criminal sentences. Um, you can start to see a pattern emerge, right? This guy, he has several um, uh, DUIs, uh, some, I think, uh, robbery, um, and he gets a score of one. Mallory has two misdemeanors, no subsequent offenses, gets a score of six. Uh, and this is just across the board. It's really targeting and hitting very hard on people of color. Um, and again, think about that example with the airplanes, right? Because if you have stop and, stop and frisk rules that predominantly uh, apply to areas where people of color live, you're going to have that overrepresented in your data set. And thereby, you follow the age old concept of garbage in, garbage out. You give it uh, racially profiled data, it's going to spit out racially profiled results, right? Machine learning will reinforce the same bias that the data uh, is based on. And this is just an overview. So um, I'm sorry you can't see that clearly, but it's basically a scale of 1 to 10. Each bar, this is 10, and this is 1. And this is the same for uh, white defendants. And you can see the amount of white defendants that had received a score of you know, 10 or 7. It's very low compared to black people that have actually been just had that heavy hand handed uh, across the board. Um, and 
it's not just around the criminal justice system where it's applied. Amazon recognition. Um, I actually ended up uh, uh, building these facial recognition systems, and there was a big backlash that happened. But the really interesting thing was uh, someone, I think ProPublica, uh, Pro uh, took a lot of senators and actually passed them over to the Amazon recognition model and then said, hey, can you detect criminals? And indeed it could. So it matched 28 members of Congress with known criminals in the uh, ACLU. Uh, I think that's, I forgot what that stands for. Uh, um, and then you can see here, despite only 20% of Congress being people of po uh, color, it falsely matched twice the amount uh, of people with criminals. So there is actually real implications for this bias. Adversarial attacks. So actually, just before I go on, because these are very challenging areas, not just on race or gender, um, but across the board. And you need smart people to actually think about what can go wrong. I'll give you an example. Uh, I work at Expedia. and. I realized something very interesting. We build these machine learning models that recommend you to go to a destination based on people that are similar to you and what, what destinations they have gone to. And I realized, I think I was in the middle of a shower or something like, like that, I realized, hang on, there's something that I missed. And it's the fact that if you imagine the top seven sex tourism destinations, right, where women are being trafficked and exploited, are we actually going in and preventing these recommendations to other sex tourists? Right? You don't want to be reinforcing antisocial behavior. So you see, it's that extreme um, because it's just a ma mathematical function, machine learning, and it keeps optimizing, but actually it doesn't understand the context. Uh, it doesn't understand who it's recommending it for. It doesn't understand the ramifications on society and the impact it can have. So. You need clever people to ask these questions and challenge data science and machine learning experts. And hopefully, this can start to open your eyes to what can actually go wrong. And on that note, adversarial attacks are some of the most scary attacks you can do. It's based on a technology where you can either attack the integrity of a deep learning model, so you completely screw up everything it's being trained on to actually get it to spit out what the hacker wants it to spit out. Or you can do some confidentiality attacks. So this happened with Google and UC Berkeley. They built an adversarial network on Gmail that, will, that spat data at the Gmail auto-suggest. You know, as you type, it has this uh, section of what you want to be sending uh, in brief messages. And actually, because of the information they sent to it, they were able to reconstruct credit card numbers because that's what it started spitting back. Uh, so these are very serious uh, uh, attacks and something people are just starting to research right now. I'll show you an example here. On the left, a picture of a panda. On the right, a picture of a panda. But actually, if I apply some noise, right? Think about it from uh, how a machine sees numbers. Do you remember that? Oh, sorry, pictures. Sees it at, uh, as numbers. If I then apply this noise to the image, then actually I can spoof the uh, deep learning model to say this is a gibbon, uh, meaning a monkey. Now, here's an example of how serious that can be. So can you see these stickers that says love and hate? Oh, it's supposed to say hate here. And there are some, there's a white sticker here and a black sticker there. Those are actually spoofing the computer vision aspect, the cameras of the self-driving cars to see Instead of a stop sign, they see 45 miles per hour. You can see it down there. It's, it's, they're showing it a stop sign, but it's showing speed limit 45 miles per hour. And it's able to do that 80% of the time. That car can be going off a cliff, right? Where, uh, uh, and you sit in a world where you think self-driving cars are more safe. They are. But this is real implications it can have. Another example. Um, Okay, all right, I guess I can't see that right now because it's not on my laptop. Um, so Tencent, a uh, huge Chinese uh, tech company, uh, showed off how they hacked a Tesla autopilot 
by putting what looks to be gum on the street, and then it uh, forcibly changed lane without asking the driver. And you can't stop it because it's, it's thinking that it has to switch lane. So it's actually that little piece of gum has in it some design uh, that hacks the neural network in a way where it gets it to do what the attacker wants. So very serious uh, security implications. In another example from a medical, uh, um, from the medical industry, so say that you go to a doctor, you get a scan of uh, uh, some skin disease you may have, and it may be uh, benign, so non-dangerous, and this is what the, uh, the image is telling you here. But actually, if you rotate the image and apply to it that noise you see there, it, it becomes malignant. And therefore, that patient is then entitled to some reimbursement, let's say, from an insurance company due to those treatments. Um, this has actually been uh, reverse engineered and actually works. So these have uh, serious, uh, serious uh, consequences within, uh, medical, uh, within the medical industry as well. Or you can imagine a different scenario uh, where you then apply a treatment to something that has been spoofed, right? You send someone to cancer treatment and chemotherapy, but in fact, they are not. But you know, you hate your neighbor, so you spoof the net network. Um, right. So how can you actually defend yourself against these systems? Well, one of the weaknesses of the self-driving cars at this point is the fact that they rely on very few sensory uh, aspects. So they rely on cameras, right? And whenever you overly rely on one sense, then the probability of someone hijacking that gets higher. Uh, in reality, you could be doing uh, multiple things. You could have a radar system. You could have sonar, like some of these uh, current cars that are not self-driving they have. Um, and therefore, use all of those to come up with an assessment, whether there is a passenger there or not. Right? Um, so using these multi multimodal systems is really the way forward to prevent it. So we are getting close towards um, the end here. Um, I want to share with you some things that may not be as intuitive. So I was reading a few stats, and they mention quite a lot of different statistics. But this is one I really like, uh, so I have a bias towards it. But um, it's saying that 20% of the jobs are expected to be displaced here in the UK over the next 20 years. But at the same time, uh, approximately the same amount of jobs will be created, new jobs, like a ro robot engineer or technician, things that, that are more in, uh, in that nature. But the types of jobs that are actually displayed, uh, displaced are not the ones you would think of intuitively. So if you split it up in cognitive labor um, and then have a look at what type of jobs, you can see there is a danger zone. That's the uh, people that are tax preparers, customer service representatives, the radiologist. Now, that's not uh, you know, a low-skilled labor, but that's because it's to do with vision. You have to analyze these images and then come up with an assessment of you know, sending that patient or escalating that patient to a doctor. Um, a translator, a telemarketer, a consumer loan underwriter, an insurance adjuster, those are probably going to be replaced very, very soon. Um, but there are also other areas where it starts to, to creep in a bit slower. And these are the columnists. So in China, they actually have an entire magazine. I think it's called Flytech or something like that. Uh, a news magazine that's written by AI, managed by AI entirely. Spits out articles written by AI. It's just absolutely crazy, but it's working. Because they redefined what it means to uh, be a news magazine they didn't want to say, OK, how do we replace the male uh, man? How do we replace the editor? No, they said, actually, how can we build this from the ground up in a way that it's entirely automated? And then you have the safe zones. And you'll notice a, 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 a pattern here. Um, it's a concierge, a social worker, psychiatrist, PR director, CEO, criminal defense attorney. Actually, these are the roles that are social by nature, right? It, it requires some very complex social relationship to, to uh, uh, excel in them. And then there are 
the other areas where it's, you can automate certain tasks within. And that's the teacher, the doctor, the GP, uh, the tour guide. And actually, the doctor, you're starting to see some of those from Babylon Health, uh, automating some of those diagnosis diagnoses. Um, a wedding planner, financial planner, a tutor. So those are maybe the ones that will be, but over a longer time span. If we look at it from a physical labor, um, the danger zone, that's fast food preparer, a restaurant cook, garment factory worker, dishwasher, fruit harvester, a truck driver. You may be able to see already what Tesla has been doing in the States uh, with these self-driving uh, trucks. And then there are other areas where you're start starting to slowly see AI making inroads. That's the taxi driver. Think about Uber. Uber, 70% of their uh, profit is going to uh, taxis, to their riders. So they are focusing a lot on replacing the riders by uh, self-driving cars. Um, aerospace mechanic, a plumber, house cleaner, uh, and so on. And then you have the safe zone. Again, notice the pattern. Elderly home caretaker, physical therapist, hairstylist, dog trainer. Those are actually very like, close to impossible to be displaced by AI. Um, and then you have kind of this area where certain tasks can be. The receptionist, the caterer, the bartender, the cafe waiter. So I hope you're starting to see kind of a more diverse picture. It's not like when the steam engine came and replaced certain type of uh, workers, or when the harvester came and replaced farm hands. Um, this is actually across the board where you are touching on job displacement. So what can you do? Well, what you can do is what I have done. So I failed in math and statistics in college. Um, I stayed away from statistics in uni. I studied marketing and hated marketing. Um, I'm really not very good at selling what I've been doing in the past. But I started um, studying this concept bit by bit because of my interest. So I'm a Syrian refugee. And because of uh, you know, how the world perceives you, I realized that I want to be able to be, uh, study these statistics and these crime reports and things like that and to uh, counter them. Um, so I started with data analysis and statistics. And actually, if I were to start over, I would know what to focus on, and therefore it wouldn't take more than six months, and you can do the same. Um, learn Python, learn how to code. Uh, I know it's almost like a meme out there on, on Twitter for everyone saying, yeah, hey, just learn how to code you know, for uh, an, old, uh, an elderly truck driver, or something like that. But you are young, predominantly young, um, and you have the ability to actually learn these new uh, uh, skills. You probably don't need more than the basics to get then into machine learning. That's how I did as well. And then you can continue uh, learning Python and data analysis. You can do a Kaggle project, a so, uh, uh, one of these online machine learning competitions. And then you can move into deep learning, but never start with deep learning first. Uh, and then finally, you can do a personal project that you are very passionate about. Um, so I'm wrapping up a project on, uh, for the Tanzanian government where I'm helping them predict which water pumps are broken uh, which ones are functional or, and which ones are functional but needs repair using machine learning so they can actually send out engineers to water pumps uh, in a way that's data driven um, because they have very limited engineers but they have around 5,000 something water pumps. So find something you are very passionate about uh, and actually set that as your north star and then it will be much easier for you to stay motivated. Uh, if you need any help with this, you know, just reach out to me because I, um, I mentor 80 people in my spare time, but also I am uh, teaching uh, uh, Expedia employees worldwide in how to become um, data scientists and how to become machine learning engineers. So I'm already doing it. I'm very passionate about it, and I can save you a lot of time by directing you towards the right resources that you should be spending. So feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for taking your time to come.